um, married with three children. My husband, uh, Jeff, is a pastor, um, ministers in evangelism and uh, encouraging the body of Christ. And uh, we basically live by faith. And the, the, I, I go to work for, for the, the, the rest of the dollars. And um, we've been married... Uh, 25 years, three children. Um, we started incredibly rocky. Uh, in, in fact, uh, on our wedding night, that was basically the end of our marriage um, and all, all hope that it, it would ever continue. So uh, the Lord has done an, an absolutely amazing thing in resurrecting a dead thing. Um, we, as I say, um, we got married, uh, yeah, it's very, once you've been in the Lord for a long time, it's very hard to, to know what part of your testimony is going to, to be of benefit to, to every, every one of us has a story that the Lord has given. And, uh, so my story will take you back to salvation but first I needed to tell you where I was before salvation experience. Our marriage uh, was set on very bad foundations right from the start. Uh, my husband was a workaholic. We were both unsaved. Came from, Jeff came from a Christian family but had walked away from the Lord um, and didn't want anything to do with it. I w came from a very... Um, anti-Christian family who, who looked at the churches as, as being people who took your money and, and took your life and there was, you know, so, so for me there was, there was nothing attractive about Christianity at all. We started the marriage and it all turned to custard. My husband was a workaholic. We, we had a, a large dairy farm down in Tokoroa and he would work probably 18 of those hours and um, the rest of it, we, we lived in a small two-bedroom cottage with three other workers and myself. So there was, there was no time for us. There was no, um, you know, it was just work, work, work. We were back to the wall with our mortgages and just finances were you know, very, very bad. And um, so uh, my response was, and I had children. I, I didn't know quite else, how else to fix the marriage, and um, I had three children in three years, and um, and that was nearly also the nail on the coffin for me. And um, after the third one was born, uh, I went on antidepressants, and a year later left, took the children and left, went down to Christchurch. Jeff totally collapsed. Um, his world, he, he thought that everything was going well, you know, as, as men often do. He thought that uh, as long as I didn't say anything and didn't rock the boat too much and as long as, you know, his meal was cooked, uh, then I was one problem he didn't have to face. He was busy working. He, he, he was fighting against, his parents had grown up in poverty, basically, and he, in a, as a knee-jerk reaction to that, decided that his family were not going to suffer financially. He was going to work, and his family were going to have. So his, his whole motive for working was to provide for us, but in doing so, he gave nothing left. He, there was nothing left for us. Um, and so what he, what he, his desires sort of, um, yeah, so he, he, when I left, he, um, he spun out, became suicidal, went on all sorts of um, antidepressants and became medicated to the point where uh, he could barely think. Uh, he, eventually he came down and saw me in Christchurch and said, look, it's just not fair. At least bring the children back up to me. At least bring them back up where I can see them. So I moved back up to the mount and uh, realized that it was going to be incredibly hard. I thought people on the DPB made it, you know, like they, they seemed to survive all right, but I didn't know how to survive on the DPB. It were three children um, at that stage, they were three under four, and, um, and I couldn't go back to work. I didn't know how to survive by myself. So eventually, one of the, one of the um, tricky bits was that when, when we had gone into the farm, 
um, he, he had a lot of trouble with his, parent, with his uh, partner, and so my parents bought them out. So when I left Jeff, I actually left my parents back on the farm with Jeff in partnership with him. So to get help for myself, they were back there with him, actually. They were ministering to my husband. And um, so it was all a bit, bit sort of messy at that stage. So I ended up going back to my husband, but in name only. I lived in the same house, and basically I was waiting until such a, a stage as they were old enough that I could go back to work, and I could, I could uh, provide for them, and we would be all right. So that was the, the stage was set. My husband was on every medication known to man. He was on uppers and downers, and uh, he, um, he just, his father got a brain tumour. He went over to Cambridge to, to be with his father, and at that stage, they, they encouraged Jeff to go to church with them. And during this time, he had a born-again experience, rang me up on the phone and said, look, Al, he said, I don't know what else to tell you except that God is real. And whether I can hang on to him or not, God is real. And he, you know, like, you've got to look, you've got to look at, at him. And I hung up the phone and I thought, well, I didn't want him before. Sure as eggs, I don't want him now. I, no, now he's going to be a religious nut. Now he's going to... So, yeah, so in my heart I was running even harder. Um, he came home and he just wanted to tell me all about it. He wanted to tell me how glorious he felt and how, and how wonderful the world was and how sparkly and how, and how rosy coloured it was. And I looked at him and I just thought, oh, you know, he's just on a high, you know, he's just on a high, this will pass. And gradually I saw him come off his drugs and probably after about six months, he was at a stage where he had stabilised out and he was basically happy. And I thought, you rotten son of... How, what right have you got to be happy and I'm so miserable? So I thought... And, and some wise person in the church told him, don't talk to her about it. Just shut up. Just Because yeah, at that stage, every time he went to church, he'd come back and he'd want to tell me, want to tell me what he'd heard and what he'd learnt. And I would just turn the television up louder and I'd turn him, I'd just read the book a bit harder and I'd just shut him out. I'd just shut him down completely. In fact, I wanted to kill that thing in him that was so excited and happy because I was miserable. And he had done it to me. This marriage that I was trapped into, he had caused misery. So, yeah, he was going to suffer. So the wise man told him, don't talk to her. Just be. Do for your wife. Be. And, um, and so he did. He started doing things. And I thought, oh, what do you want? You know, like he, he, could, he couldn't win really. But he started behaving differently. He started actually looking attentive and looking like he was wanting, just wanting to help, and uh, yeah. so then I got a drawing, I started inside, I thought, I want to know what this thing is that he's found, and uh, so I, I went along to a church meeting with him, it was a Western carrier, who was a farmer just like Jeff, and to a, to, went to a dinner meeting, and I actually thought he was a very boring speaker, to be honest. <laughs> so there was nothing charismatic about the drawing. There was nothing about anything. I wasn't even really interested in his story. But the whole meeting, my heart was going, mm, and I knew that there was something here for me. I knew, and I wanted, by this time I'd been, I'd watched Jeff long enough, I knew that he, there was something there for me. And I wanted it. So I, I, I had made a decision in my heart. I was going to play the game. I was going to, I was going to um, find out what this thing was. If there was anything real, I'd find it. And, um, and so at the beginning of the night, he said, is there any unsaved here? I put my hand up. At the end of the night, I thought he said, is those people who put their hands up earlier put their hands up now? In fact, he gave an altar call. I didn't hear the altar call. I heard what I heard. So I put my hand up, went to the front, realized what the call was, wanted to panic. My pa and I, Jeff's pastor was behind me saying the words, so I kind of mumbled the words of salvation. Turned around, and I saw my husband sitting there with a group of his friends, 
beaming smile, tears running down his face, and I thought, oh, this, this has to be the single worst thing I have ever done to my husband. He now has hope. He now has hope that I am going to become a Christian. And I knew in my heart that nothing had changed. I knew in my heart that this, was, this, wasn't, this wasn't right. And I felt this big. And I sat down like a worm. And when they were all sort of coming up, wanting to put their arms around me, and I just shucked them off. And I said, I'm not one of you. I'm not one of you. The pastor came home with us and challenged us and said, look, if God is real, give him 10 days. Or no, give him, give him some time. And uh, in their conversation, I thought, yeah, my heart was still going like this. I felt absolutely like this, but my heart was going. And uh, so in my heart, I'd, I'd named 10 days. I said, okay, for 10 days, I will try and find this God you talk about. And for 10 days, it became an, a consuming thought in my mind. Just absolutely, I couldn't get, God, if you're there, Lord, I, I need something. I need you. Whatever you are, I need you. I need to find hope because this life sucks. And, um, and it's just me and God in that time. And um, went to church on that, I went first Sunday, next Sunday, that was the 10th day. And um, went to church in the morning, nothing. Came home, Jeff said, one of our children got chicken pox. I said, well, that's it. I've tried, it's not real. I can't find any reality, Jeff. That's, that's it, I'm giving up. And he said, no, no, I know God. You've got one more try. You go, you go tonight by yourself. And um, so I felt, when I went there, I went like I was going into the lion's den. I thought, oh, I thought they're all going to think, you know, what are they going to think, all these people, you know, that I'm now coming in, you know, they, they, I knew that they knew the story. And so I went in, feel, in fear and trepidation, and halfway through the worship, this most glorious, glorious feeling came through me, essence of love. And I knew that this, I had never, ever been loved before. And I knew this was, this, this I embraced it so with such entirety, every bit of my being, because I was being saturated in just pure essence of love. And, um, yeah, I've never walked away. I, I, you can't walk away from that when you know love. And um, so I came home, and do you know Jeff had done an absolute miracle? Jeff, God had done an absolute miracle in my heart because I walked in the door, and he was sitting there sort of, a little bit edgy thinking, you know, what was I going to say now? You know, I had a very sharp edge to my tongue. And, and um, I walked in and I looked at him and I thought, oh God, I am so sorry. He's a good man. You know, what have I been doing all these years? And somehow God had taken that anger and the bitterness out. And you know, we had a honeymoon. We had three months honeymoon and it was just, it was wonderful. In that time, we got addressed with issues, like um, we went round to the pastor's place uh, a couple of weekend, you know, a couple of Sundays later, and um, he, he told us about tithing. And I said, well, I've never heard of tithing. What's that? And uh, so he explained it to me, and so Jeff and I decided on the way home, yes, you know, because up until now, up until then, I had always given him pocket money. I'd given him five cents to put in the offering plate because I believed that God, well, no, I believe that the church would take all our money. And because, it, because that's what my parents had always told me. So I gave him his little bit to make sure that he didn't overspend. And um, so we we'd learned about tithing, and I understood it. I understood the principle. And so we, we decided, yeah, okay, from then on, that was it. We were going to always tithe. We'd, it, was, it was sealed. It was a done deal. Do you know, Monday morning we get this tax bill in the, in the mail, four and a half thousand. We had expected one and a half and we got four and a half thousand when we were already short. And um, I, I just sunk and I said, well, well, we can't tithe now. And Jeff said, no, of course we can. They can wait. They can wait for their money. We will drip feed them. God will get his. And from then on, you know, it's always been that way. God first, everything else can wait. Drip feed, that's fine. And, and these principles that, that I know that we've been Christians a long time and you, and you get challenged all the way through your life. 
as to, to which way you're going to go. Jeff understood truth sets you free. So he, um, he wanted to witness to my brother who's, um, who's living a gay lifestyle in Sydney. He wanted to share with him and, and to relate to him. He needed to share some um, intimate problems that he had had over, over the years before we were married. And so he, he knew that to do that, he had to share with me. He had to open up. So he told me um, some problems that he had had with porn pornography. And um, so I kind of took it, and I, and I sat there while he witnessed to my brother thinking, yes, thank you, Lord, because my brother was listening to him. And I thought, yes, I wanted, what, I wanted my brother to come into the, into the kingdom. So I think, as it was, he, ex he, he, he listened, and he went on his way, and then Jeff and I were left. And inside, I just started seething again. This was the reason our marriage never worked. Why didn't you tell me? You know, this... The, you know, and once again, I picked up all the anger, all the hatred, but with added teeth. And so I was, once again, I wanted to rip his throat out, and I wanted to, this, this was too much. And so out to the couch I go again for a yet another night, and waiting till morning to take the children away. And um, halfway through the night, I'm sitting there angry as, and the Lord said, you leave me, or you leave Jeff. You're leaving me. I said, what? Not you, Lord. I can, I, Jeff, yes, you know, two seconds, that's it. He's gone. I, you know, no problem at all with that, but not you, Lord, not you. I've, you know, like I'd, I'd, hung, I'd grabbed a hold of him. That was, that was, that was my lifeline. And, um, and he said, you've had it my way. You've known my ways, you, but you choose your ways or my way. And I suddenly, it was kind of like the penny dropped again, you know, like we had had such a honeymoon. And what had changed? I had changed. I had changed. And so somehow in that encounter with the Lord, it was he shut the back door on my running. And Jeff and I, from that time on, had to work things out. We, um, I, I stayed, I told him what, what had, uh, the experience I'd had in the night time, he absolutely praised God because he, he had seen the hatred and everything come back and he thought it was lost again. And, but he stood on the thing the Lord said, you know, the truth would, would set you free. You know, like it's sort of um, his truth set us free, but he also says, tell the truth. You know, say um, in his telling of the truth, the Lord also vindicated him. Now we had to learn we had to learn all sorts of things. You know, we would hold hands every day and say, Lord, we don't know what it is to be a husband and wife. We don't know what it is to, to, to love sexually. We don't know truly what it is to, to role model a, a good marriage. And so every day, that was, that was our cry. You know, Lord, show us. Help us to be, um, a, a, help me to be a woman of God. Help me to bring my children up in the ways of the Lord. Help me to be a, a wife that, that can lift a husband up and encourage him. Help me to, to be the best woman for him. And, um, and his cry was the same, you know, help me to be a man that was, that's going to be a, a husband, that's going to be able to, to love and nurture and bring up her children. And so our journey just continued all the way through. And it's always just a response to the, to the choices that we're all cha faced with choices every day. Which way do we respond? Do we pick up the old way and come out with fist fighting? Do we come out and be snaky and dirty? Or do we just begin to pray and work it out? And, and my encouragement to you is that it's always going to be the gentle answer that turns away wrath. It's that it's not becoming a doormat. It's not being used and abused. It's, it's actually working on your relationship, valuing the relationship, and become, beginning to work as a team. And I think, by the looks, I'm probably out of money. And that we've all, you know, the testimonies go on and on and on and on. And they become bigger and bigger and bigger because the challenges become bigger. And so the victories can become much bigger. And the life with the Lord is exciting. Okay, thank you. And now I'm going to call on our speaker, Joanne 
Wickland, and uh, I'm going to pray for her before she speaks. I don't know anything about Joanne. I've only just met her today, but I'm going to leave it all up to her because I'm sure she has a lot to tell you. Father God, I just bring Joanne before you right now, and I thank you for her, Father. I thank you for all the things that you're going to do through her this weekend. And what she speaks to us ladies, I pray that they take this in, they sift through it and, and just follow it through in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Right. Now, so the DP actually works. Uh, mm, I'm not very used to that, actually. I'm happy with this. I, I won't try anything. I won't try anything too new. Ladies, my name is Joanne, and I'm married to uh, Pastor Jeff over there. You'll be hearing him, I think, oh, tonight, I think, yeah. And uh, we look after a church that we started with our family of five. I mean, that is us two, three children, and six others. We started about 15 years ago up in Auckland. Now, I don't know if you can see, it's quite bright, but this is my family here. Can you see it very clearly? Right. Now, this one's Faith here, my oldest. You can see she's actually pregnant there. She was pregnant with her third child. Um, she's a very happy girl, had a real call of God on her life, actually, to become, she wanted to become a missionary when she was 10. And as the years went by, I experienced that, you know, you think when you have your ingredients of a cake and you mix it all up, you are going to get the cake that you have started out with. Well, actually, it didn't happen. And that poor girl, I must say, my gosh, she, she lost her ministry, lost her career, lost her girlhood in a way. And, um, yeah, but she is married over in Australia. And, as I say, that's her third child. We'll be going to see them in July. And, uh, yeah, life is going on for her. So, but what I see is that, you know, when the pot doesn't turn out a particular way the first time, it says that the potter just crunches up the clay and gets started on a new pattern, doesn't he? Yeah, so that's Faith. Jeremy, my boy, he's 21 and a half. Um, lovely boy, actually, and he's nearly finished his apprenticeship as an auto technician. Jeff, of course, myself, and lastly, Mary Rose. She is last year of school now, in fact, sitting an exam today, and uh, a very lovely girl as well. Both of those actually went through a lot of pain, watching Faith's pain. And uh, they don't want to make the same mistake, goodness me. But uh, life, is, life is tough at times. And I just so appreciate that testimony. I don't see where you're sitting now, but... Um, oh, right. That was a great testimony, and it just works in so well with what I've got today. Okay. Now, when I say we, we look after a church, Pastor Jeff preaches... And I would describe myself as being the glue between components. And um, I won't reel off the list of, of the things that I'm involved in because I am sure that all of you have involvements and responsibilities that demand something of you, too. Um, women are especially good at being glue. And I think if we do a good job of that, we make an indescribable difference to people's lives. And if you've had children, you'll know the little tuck-in time at night and those, in a sense, golden minutes when your child says something that's really bothered them that day and you impart your little bit of life to them. That's how, you know how they say, line upon line and precept upon precept. That's how you build up your kids or, in the case of all your family or whoever you're connected with. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing, very valuable. The business term would probably, they'd say, facilitator. But I think when you've got God's spirit and your spirit, you're a facilitator, not because you're good at organizing, but because you've got heart. And that's very valuable. All right, I, I, through the email, someone sent me some beautiful pictures. You know, people are sending you stuff all the time, and I've pretty well said, don't, don't do that. But this was lovely, and I want to show, actually only one slide's applicable here, but they're so beautiful, I want to show you the whole lot. Um, let's see if I can work this. Point it towards this one, that one. 
Okay. You won't get the sound here. Whew, it's very warm, isn't it? Are you a bit warm? Might have some heaters on. Maybe I need to click through each slide, do I? It should be doing itself. The one who takes you, oh, right, yeah. Now, can you see that? Oh, my goodness, it's gone. Gosh, how do I stop that, Jeff? Go back there. Yeah. Now I want to stop there. Will it stay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> can you read the bottom there? Life is drawing without an eraser. My goodness me. I think if we had a choice, we would not like that. Um, that's not the way we'd choose it. Um, I think that we think if we have one chance at a masterpiece, we want it to be pretty good. But life is such that situations begin to happen and we feel that when it's happened that the picture is not gonna get much better than that. And actually my topic today is hope in hopeless situations. Most people have faced or will face situations that they feel there's no solution for. But I wanna tell you that we may not see a solution, but God does. He's the one who talks of, when you walk through the valley, my rod and staff will comfort you. And he speaks of treasures in the darkness. And you can't get those in light and happy circumstances, even though we'd rather live there. He's no stranger to suffering of our body or of our soul. Now, the trouble with being in a seemingly hopeless situation is that we sometimes don't look to God for the answers, but we look to the world to see what it can offer us. And we can come away with confusion, disappointment, and a bleakness. Actually, we may know that the answer is to look to God, but I also know that in some situations, it is all we can do to barely survive. I want to tell you about a, a situation in my own life happened many years ago when I was single. Um, I hooked up with the wrong person and um, he was a very controlling guy, actually. And uh, as time went on, I mean, I, I, I was a Christian, he was a Christian and all this sort of thing, but a very controlling young man. And um, things were quite horrible. I kept trying to do my best, but I can tell you right now, if you are under any controlling person, they have a yardstick. You will never reach it because it moves. They move it. And so anyway, I was with God. I, you know, quoted verses left and right and all that sort of thing. And one day he said, if you'd only do what I told you, everything would be all right. And I thought, well, I don't think so, actually. But I thought, okay, I'll give it a go and I'll prove to you it's not right. That was the worst thing I could ever do. Because I remember very distinctly, I said to God, now I'm not 
removing you as such from being my God, but I'll put him there, I'll do whatever he says, and we'll prove that it doesn't work. But in reality, I took my God away, and he became God. And when you do that, my goodness, you reap the consequences of whatever idol you put in place there. Wow, what a hard taskmaster. And so I just spiraled down. And in fact, I became very depressed. I didn't even know it was depression, actually. I knew of the term, but that sort of happened to other people, and I couldn't figure what was happening to me. And I had such a black cloud over me, I actually looked up to the ceiling to see it. Two dollars in the missionary box. <laughs> That's what I say to the ladies in our church. Anyway, um, and so I looked up to see this cloud, and I was quite surprised I could see the ceiling. It was so palpable. And I just felt like crying all the time. And in fact, I'd converse with people, even laugh with people, and think, you have no idea how I'm feeling. My weight went right down. Goodness me, I was six stone, and I didn't feel like eating at all. But I thought, I won't force myself to eat, and I won't give in to not eating. I'll take a halfway point here. And if I feel like going halfway across town to get a piece of cheesecake, take one bite and throw it away, yet I will still do it. I don't care what it costs me in time or money. I will keep myself just eating that way. Anyway, I also I would, I would get home at night, fall into bed and just think, oh, thank goodness. And then it seemed like, boof, you know, it would be daylight. And I'd say, God, another day. You know, just trying to gird up my loins to get through. I was absolutely exhausted. I wanted to die or, or be maimed. I thought if I have some horrific accident, paralyzed, uh, then he'll kind of feel sorry for me and all that and be nice to me. So either dying or being maimed just basically became quite a heart's cry, actually. But you know, the very worst thing was I didn't feel that God could reach and get that out of me. Down inside, I felt this ball of grief and pain, and I, it was like I saw God's hand coming through my body here, reaching down, but he couldn't reach it. The thing is, is that in the, in the Bible it says, my arm is not shortened that it cannot save. But my belief was, it is too deep. I can't, he can't take it. And so I was in a very bad, bad way there. And do you know, after I got out of that, you know, I got out of that situation, I mean, gosh, nowadays we'd just say, see you later, this isn't working, you know, and back off and deal with it. But I was pretty young at the time, and you try and try and try. Anyway, eventually got out of that, back on track with the Lord, and doing really well, um, relying on him and everything. But for years afterwards, I would have these, it's like prodded to, you know, that I just might kill myself. I didn't want to, but when I was walking on a beach, I'd walk up on the soft sand. I wouldn't walk down by the waves, just in case. When I was walking upstairs, I wouldn't look out the window, I'd keep my eye firmly on the wall, that type of thing. And there was this pressure. You know, it prodded me and prodded me, and it was inexplicable to me, because on one hand, I loved God, was walking with him. On the other was this kind of push all the time, I just might drive into a wall instead of keeping on the road. And I want to say to you ladies that what I had actually done, I had allowed a legal foothold for the negative spiritual kingdom to prod me and prod me like that. Um, I didn't realize, and as I was battling with this, and a bit too ashamed to kind of tell anybody about it, but finally I did. I told just the right person, and she just identified it straight away. And she said, it is not you wanting to do that. It's, it's, the, it's the, in a sense, the demonic world that is, has, has got its legal place in you because whether through ignorance or through design or whatever, it's got its place. And so we prayed the right kind of prayer to just cut that out and it no longer had any power on me. And I would just say, look, it may not be a suicide thing. Could be a deep grief. Could be lying. Could be lust. Anything that has got that foothold. And to be honest with you, when a thing's got a legal foothold, it is not going to leave you alone. 
and you have got to, in a sense, legally cut it off. And so we can we can pray about that today. Okay, I want to have a look at um, yes, the same thing still sitting up there. That's good. I want to have a look at a couple of people in the Bible who faced hopeless situations. Now, remem remember King David. He started life in the healthy outdoors. He was very courageous and brave. Fought a lion and a bear with his hands. Goodness me, probably a club as well, but close up, whatever. He was very handsome and fabulous fighter. I mean, thousands admired his strategy and his valiance, val valiancy, is that right? Yes, he was very, very valiant anyway. He had a great relationship with God. He had a gift for music and for singing, and uh, he had a responsible position ordained by God for him. But you know, this very man in his life, he had occasion to cry out like this. And actually, I thought of th these verses when you were testifying. I don't know. How long will you forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have sorrow in my heart every day? day. Save me, O oh God, for the waters are overwhelming my soul. I sink in deep mire where I cannot get a foothold. I'm weary of crying. My throat is dry and my eyesight is blurred. I mean, that is a real cry from the heart, isn't it? You know, for years he lived in harsh conditions after he was anointed king. Life was unfair. But what I love, more often his prayers became this. Sorry, wrong one. Keep me alive, O God, for in you do I put my trust. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face will I seek. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he leant his ear down towards me and heard my cry. I've set the Lord before me, because he is right beside me, I shall not be moved. Great verses. Now, David would talk to his soul. Actually, I'm going to hand this over to my husband because when it starts doing its own thing, he'll know what to do. Okay. I'm going to back up to Genesis a little bit here. So, as I said, David would talk to his soul. Why did he do this? Why didn't it just say David prayed, such and such? But he would, he would talk to his soul. Now, when God was creating, he said to himself, let us make man in our own image. Now, as water is always, the chemical compound is H2O. Now, whether it is a liquid for you to drink or plants to grow, whether it is ice, which will preserve things, whether it is steam, which drives and makes for power, it is always H2O, but in every state it achieves very different things. And so, God is indeed one, but he refers to himself in the plural. And so he includes the word, capital W, so a person, the word and the spirit. God, the word and the spirit. And in different states, he achieves different things by his trinity. And so in the first, few hand, hand, at the first handful of verses in John, uh, it talks about the word, that is part of God, becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. That's Jesus. So from the eons of time, there was the word. The word comes down to spend, in a sense, a 33 years here on earth. Anyway, he said to the other parts of his being, let us make man in our own image. Now, just like God, while these parts overlap, they also achieve different things in our states. So we have our body does things, our soul, which consists of three thirds, a mind, will, and emotions, body and soul, mind, will, and emotions, and your spirit. And so, you know, we we're talking about painting. Well, if you can think about painting, you will think, yes, I'll do this. You will plan in your mind, mm, I'd like these colors together. Your body will achieve it, you know. 
and so on. That applies to everything in life. You're using something of those three components. So David felt it was important. He says, um, in actual fact, no, I'll just talk about the spirit here. Um, it's in our spirit that our beliefs are built and subsequently our behavior, they spring from it. So in the first few years of your life, your parents are your mirror. Then as you go on, your teachers and other kids join that rank and you go on again, a boyfriend, a husband, join that rank as well. And if they, through whatever deficiency, don't show the value, don't show that you are valuable to them by word or touch or concern, you'd find yourself unsure, even doubtful of your value. And that means that even if you win a beauty contest or you're first in the class or people are saying, wow, you do that really well, or, you know, yeah, I rely on you, you're great. Even if they say that, the platform of belief in here may not agree with it. Intellectually, you say, yes, I did win that beauty contest. And here, it's like you know it, it can't be true. And so accordingly, your behavior is you're always looking for and needing affirmation. Now, I don't know if David had this problem. Certainly, he was the youngest, and it's clear that his brothers didn't think that he was up to much. Listen to what one of them said here. What are you doing here? And who have you left those few sheep in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere? I know you think you're big. I know your deceit. You've just come here to see the battle. Now, whether David always got it in the neck or whether he was expected as the youngest to just be seen and not heard, I don't know. But many times in his prayers, he addressed his soul, the mind, his will, what he was going to do, his emotions. And verbally, he would command his soul to get into line when he felt down. He questioned out loud, Why are you so depressed, O oh my soul? You hope in God, because I am going to praise him. See the will in there? See the, oh, see the, see the emotions in there? And he makes up his mind, I'm going to do this. So, um, your spirit and soul are actually very closely connected. They're overlapping at times. But if God's spirit lives in yours, the Bible says in Romans that we need to walk according to that spirit. Because your soul always looks for pleasure. It looks for what's going to make it feel good. And sometimes that's to the detriment of your relationship with God. Yeah. Um, sometimes, goodness me, you've got to rein in your soul, actually, because, uh, hello, hello, no. Um, otherwise, it'll drive according to how it feels. So, will I go to this meeting? Oh, no, I think probably, you know, once a fortnight, and no, 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 and I'm not really getting much out of the Bible now. Oh, look, really, I don't know where to look next, and um, no, I don't feel like a Bible reading plan. I just go with how I feel, and, you know... Your, your, your soul will drive you how it feels best. So you have to watch out for that. Now let's have a look at another figure who was bitter towards God for what I think may partly have been her own fault, actually. And that is Naomi. Now do you remember, she, her husband, and two sons left Israel because there was a big famine there, went off and settled in another country. Now, they stayed there, either because uh, they just wanted to or because they, you know, how you get into a situation, you just settle in. Now, in the course of time, her husband dies. And her two boys that had actually married daughters and uh, married other women in, in the meantime, the boys died as well. And so she was left with nothing there to stay for. So she decides, okay, I'm going to go back to Israel. Now, amazingly, one of the daughters-in-law, Ruth, insists that she's going to go back with her. She says, no, I'll leave my people, I'll leave my country, I'll leave my God. Let your people be my people, and your God be my God. And so she sticks with her. Hence, they, be, um, they begin their big journey. Now, it's an arduous journey. 
They've got to find food along the way, and maybe they had to stop and work for that. There's hot, sunny days, there's cold, probably deserty sort of nights, and probably didn't wash for quite a while. But finally they get home, and the neighbours call out to her warmly. And what does she say? Call me Mara, meaning bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. So, what is she seeing? She sees a dead family, nothing to show for the last 10 years of work. This is what I was thinking, you might have. Why didn't you go back to Israel earlier? The famine was clear, has clearly been over for a while. How did you worship God in a godless situation for 10 years, actually? What did the family die of? Would they have died of it back home? I don't know if you can see the bottom there. We might also ask, you have a loving and completely devoted daughter who accompanied you, who wants to look out for your well-being in every way. Has God really left you bereft? If you have suffered loss, God might be asking you, what is that in your hand? Just like he asked Moses, actually. Remember, Moses didn't think he had anything with which to go forward. So God says to him, what is that in your hand, Moses? Now, I would imagine that God would have liked to have replied to Naomi's better comment, Naomi, my child, what have you got in your hand? And do you know what she had? Her family's land, her family's house, a wonderful daughter for companionship and help, caring neighbours, and she was back in a safe, providing environment if anything went wrong. Her comment to the neighbours was, the Lord has brought me back again empty. Hope was actually around her, but she didn't even want to see it. But our God is like no other. While he is worthy of our highest recognition and love, he seeks, to, he seeks to draw us. And in a sense, he, is, he knows that if we uh, see the light, we'll give him his proper due. But in the meantime, if we refuse to have him in the foreground, he will actually draw, start drawing in the background. Now, ladies, are you staying awake here? It is pretty warm. Okay. Rightio. So what did God do here? Ruth asked permission from Naomi if she can go and work. By God's good grace, he, she gets into the most opportune field for her. Her character stands her in good stead. And she is noticed by the very one that God has ordained to marry her, who is going to look after Ruth, uh, look after Naomi as well, and produce offspring that eventually is in the godly line leading to Jesus Christ himself. Now, could Naomi ever have fathomed such a thing? I mean, could she have planned such an end? It's just amazing. And what I love is her neighbors said this of her good fortune. Now, they're talking about Ruth's husband. He will be the, the restorer of your life. Now, ladies, there's quite a few of you here who might remember, you know, back on TV, they used to advertise Pledge, but in a spray-on bottle. Yeah. Do you remember there was a gorgeous table, and they'd spray on the Pledge, give it a good rub, and then they would hold up a six-inch ruler on the table. And, of course, the, si the shine was so fabulous, you could see the reflection six inches in. I mean, it was really good, Ed. I've never forgotten that. I love that. Because he restores not only on the surface, but in depth. And um, what has been so precious to me, actually, is Psalm 23, when it says, He restores your soul. And I don't know, there's probably not too many electrician-y sort of ladies amongst us. Maybe not, I don't know. But I think of why is undone. And when your mind is feeling pulled apart, your emotions, we would know about that. Just imagine why is pulled apart as well. But I have taken hold. I've always remembered that six-inch depth ruler and that beautiful word restore, which means to bring back to. I love the thought of God putting the wires back together, 
putting the little sheath around it and so on, actually rejoining up my soul. It's a great verse, that one. Now, here's an interesting thing. If we nurture bitterness as one nurtures a plant, it is going to grow. It's a universal law. What you feed will grow. Now, some of you gardeners might be saying, well, are you sure about that? Yes, <laughs> it is a universal law. You just pray for your plants. So the first good decision Naomi made was to go return to the place of God. It was quite a few months before Ruth married Boaz, and obviously quite a few months again before she had a child. But how long was it before Naomi began to unfold the grudge that she nursed? Now, there's just so much that's going to happen naturally, but what we cultivate, we also have to kill. Now, in the book of Hebrews, it says this, Stand up tall, make straight paths for your feet, let that which is broken be healed. Follow peace and holiness and watch out in case you don't take hold of God-given ability, which is offered to you, and a root of bitterness spring up and trouble you and then defile you. Well, my goodness, I think we saw that in Naomi, don't you think? I mean, look at that. Root of bitterness, she was certainly troubled, but defiled, goodness me, to, the, to, to a terrible point, actually. So what did Naomi need to do with this bitterness? Can we just have the next one there? Let all bitterness be put away from you and be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. Put away, like taking clothes to the op shop. You know what I mean? Put away from you. Because bitterness is going to, I mean, it, it is a terrible thing to think that it is going to take you down on a staircase there. And when you see a staircase of words in the Bible, you know, see that as a progression in time. And that is what happened. Naomi was away for 10 years in a godless situation. Things happened, and there was that progression with her where it uh, finally defiled her. But think about this. To have hope, you've got to have a reason for it, don't you? You could suddenly say, well, I hope that my husband and I are going to com communicate better now. Or I hope that the rest of the family don't have so much influence in our home life. But in life, what is will continue to be and keeps on becoming unless there's a catalyst to change it. And a catalyst is something that starts off or kicks off a reaction. And you have to have a catalyst for your hope to be real, to be an actuality. Otherwise, it stays a thought. It's got to have substance. Now, if you can just show the next one, Jeff, there are three ways hope has substance. One, that you see the result already, in which case you don't need hope anymore. Two, something verbal or seen indicates there's a reason to hope. Now, for example, your church might tell you, oh, we have got money to build on more rooms now. But as I say, that of course requires trust that they're telling the truth until you see the building start to happen and then you don't need hope anymore because you see it beginning to happen. But the third way is to have a reason for solid belief. And I would put it to you that Christ gives us a good reason, enough reason for solid belief. You see, if you are a Christian, you've been adopted into his family and a daughter by blood, that is his blood, on the cross. Um, there are certain expectations of being in that family. Um, maybe you might show the next one, Jeff. The most important is a father who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. You will never have to be completely alone. Another expectation as in part of that family is based on the promise of these verses, my paraphrase. I could see what you were like before you were born. And I wrote about what you looked like in a book before you'd been formed. I think precious thoughts about you that are so many, they are more than grains of sand on a beach. 
In other words, you're of continual value to your father. So one, he'll never leave you alone. Two, he's thinking about you. You're of value. C, then this, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That is so beautiful, isn't it? To give you a future and a hope. He does not put you here, then leave you to get on with it. Now, who saw, um, you know, the original My Fair Lady, Rex Harrison and Audrey Hepburn? You know the movie, right? And you remember um, Alfred P. Doolittle, who goes to buy money from his daughter, and he says she owes it to him, and his friends say, what does she owe you for, Alfie? And he says, um, because I give her the greatest gift that any man can ever give any human being. I give her life. And then I give her this whole world to go out and enjoy it. Now leave it to enjoy it. I'm sure he says leave it to enjoy it. God is not like that. He has plans. And even if you think that you have muffed the best of them, he still has plans. The whole thing is, is do you actually believe that? Do you believe these verses? Are you in his family? I'll talk about that a little later on. You see, it's a bit difficult to have hope if you don't believe that God means what he says. No one hopes for something unless they believe that there's a chance for it happening. If you can believe what he says, even a little bit, that is called faith. And it can be as little as a wee mustard seed, but if that's however much you've got, that means you've got a basis for hope. The Bible says faith is the substance that is kind of like concrete, faith is the concrete of things hoped for, the evidence, like an exhibit, of things not seen yet. Not seen yet. Well, ladies, we have talked about how King David got through his dark and despairing situations by having faith in his Father God. He saw his situation, but he also saw the hand of God and he, could, he knew he could pray and eventually receive an answer. We talked about Naomi, who was blind to God's hand. Now, she might have had a relationship with him, a believing relationship with him once, but perhaps in the years of the godless situation, she, uh, it had waned, and she had become critical, skeptical, and even wrong in her understanding of God. Nevertheless, Ruth's a figure of someone coming out of darkness into light and turning her back on other idols and coming to the true God. And God responds to that. In fact, he blessed her hugely, but not only her, those in her world, those around her, Boaz and Naomi were hugely blessed because of her. All of their lives flourished and were blessed because of this woman. So we're not told whether Naomi and her heart returned to him and acknowledged his great goodness. I mean, everyone praised her and said, yes, look at this, look at this. And she did say, oh, yes, I've got a, a, a child in my old age and that sort of thing. I wonder if she said, sorry, God. I, I, I said, really, I judged you. What about yourself? I mentioned being part of God's family. And adoption's a legal thing. Becoming a daughter of God doesn't happen because of the way that our parents brought us up. Um, because you see Christianity as the most workable set of laws for a community. Or because you feel you're a very good person anyway. A lot of people feel like that. I'd like to illustrate this actually, but I can't hold the mic and do it at the same time. <laughs> I pinched a Jason's motel book here. All right. Let's say this is me, and I will say here, and there's a lot of words in this book, probably not enough actually, but imagine this is full of everything wrong I've ever done. But not only that, everything wrong I've ever said. Now just think about that when you're in the car. Everything wrong you've ever thought even, and even the things that you should have done but you turned your back on or pretended you didn't see and so on, that, so that you ne neglected to do. Now, this is over life, 
we're talking decades and decades here, ladies. <laughs> so there's an awful lot, and this probably isn't big enough. All right. God looks down from heaven, and what does he see? He's, he really wants a relationship with me, but he sees the sins in the way. And so in the course of time, he has to have a, a plan for this. He sends his son Jesus to come down, born as a baby at Christmas time. He grows to be a man. He tells us the ways of God. But he has to die on a cross for us. And the Bible says that all of us have gone astray. And all of us have done our own thing. And so God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the beautiful verse that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he took that, and he actually went down into hell, as a matter of fact. But hell could not hold him because he was completely sinless himself. And so he rose, came to sit by the right hand of the Father, and when God looks down on me now, what does he see? I've confessed my sins. They are not in the way. So he can have a relationship that starts now and goes on for eternity. Isn't that great? Now, I don't know whether you've thought of your Christian life in that way. Goodness me, we've come from a whole heap of de uh, denominations here. I only know that my, my mother, when she was growing up, they... I mean, such a thing was unheard of. It was basically that you're a Christian if you're a good person. And do you know what I based my salvation on when I was um, confronted with this whole thing of being a Christian? I thought, oh, gosh, um, I'm kind to animals, and I don't swear. Yep, I'm a Christian. <laughs> so that was, that, was, that was my criteria because, uh, yeah, I didn't want to be making any decisions. Anyway, to be part of God's family or to be an heir or an inheritor of these promises and his goodness, we need to receive forgiveness from him, put our trust in Jesus' blood or in his life that he gave at the cross. So if you or someone close to you has ever faced any of the things that we talked about, we've covered a bit of ground today, and yet the response has been, well, I've got to live with it. i just got to live with it. Then we can pray about that too. I talked about a catalyst that kicks off a reaction. There is a saying, if you do what you've always done, then you're going to get what you always got. And that is so true. So change starts with the little mustard seed. Can you have that much faith in God? Now, I don't know, we may have touched on some things today that you feel, yes, you'd like to pray through. Some of the legal footholds, goodness me, you are not going to get anywhere without praying that, that through if there's anything there. But I'd just like to ask now, that um, Sandy, if you'd like to just quietly pr pray, a uh, play, sorry. And look, if any of you want to come forward for some prayer, and Jeff is quite happy to pray as well, and he moves in gifts of word of knowledge and prophecy. We will ask God to come into that situation. Do you know what God says? I give hope that does not disappoint. So let's believe God. <laughs> 